Hi guys and welcome to another 7 minute lecture. I want to do a video on history and philosophy. I haven't touched on the merging of the two in a while. So I thought I'd go do something which uh, most people don't know much about. Ancient China is full of thinkers, strategists, philosophers, writers and while some of them are remembered and known widely around the world, others don't get the attention they deserve. So for instance, Confucius and Sun Tzu are still recognizable names in intellectual circles all over the world, but many others are forgotten. One such thinker is Wu Kui, an ancient Chinese military philosopher and thinker belonging to the legalist tradition in ancient China. More specifically, I wanted to pick out something that would be of relevance even today. So, Wu Kui, also known as Master Wu, wrote a treatise known as Wu Zhu or Master Wu. It's one of the most influential pieces of military philosophy from China and it's included as part of the famous seven military classics which are considered to be the seven most important military texts from ancient China and they include uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War as well. It's just that The Art of War ends up getting far more attention than any of the others possibly because it's a lot easier to read. In the Wuzhu, there are many interesting discussions because most ancient Chinese philosophy is in the form of a dialectic, as in it would be like somebody asked this and Master Wu said this, someone else asked that and someone else said that. It's always in the form of a Q&A session. The interaction that I wanted to cover was where Master Wu talks about the different types of war because I find that fascinating. Remember, we are talking about a thinker who was from roughly about, let's say, 2,300 years ago, give or take a century. And yet, many of the things that he notes here are still so relevant in modern discussions about the motivations for countries to go to war. So, Master Wu lays down five reasons countries and kingdoms might go to war, as in five types of armies that can be raised for specific purposes. Number one, a righteous army. This is where war is fought for a righteous or just purpose. In fact, the way one of the translations describes it is as rescuing the people from chaos. As far as I know, this is the first ever description of the idea of humanitarian intervention. In the modern world, this is now the norm, as you all know. In today's world, no matter how powerful you are, you have to make up some kind of excuse for why you're the good side and why you invading this other country is actually for humanitarian reasons. But you could also argue that true humanitarian war does exist, like in cases where we try to prevent crimes against humanity. So that would fall under the definition of Master Wu's righteous war, a righteous army. So here's a guy in ancient China, millennia before these ideas were discussed by classic liberal thinkers like John Stuart Mill. The second type is a strong army where the war is fought for fame and glory and that's the primary motivation of the army. Before the 20th century, it was quite common in many parts of the world to embark on conquest simply for fame and glory. You could argue that many kings and generals in times before us simply wanted to be remembered as great conquerors and that was their main motivation for going to war. Some historians would even put Alexander the Great as an example in this classification where some of his biographers claim that it was the thrill and fame that he was after which is what kind of drove him to conquest. The third classification is a hard army. This is where you go to war out of anger. Now, I'm kind of simplifying the point here by trying to think of modern examples, but I guess we could use the international intervention against Saddam Hussein's annexation of Kuwait as an example of hard war. There was a lot of anger from the Western powers in terms of how dare someone think he can do this on our turf. We could actually consider any type of retaliatory military action in general as a part of this. As you know, even in modern world politics, it's considered legitimate to retaliate against attacks. This would fall under hard war, as in wars and armies that are raised out of anger to respond to something angrily. The fourth is what he calls a fierce army. 
This is where an army is raised and war is waged for economic benefits. While the earlier section of a strong army was for fame, the primary motive of a fierce army is loot, money, economic reward. If we were to follow 20th century analyses of warfare, this is the most common reason often attributed to why people go to war. So modern day Marxists, for example, believe that every war is fought for economic gain and they would probably love this category. So a fierce army is when an army is raised, uh, is, uh, raised sorry, for economic gain. And finally, we have a contrary army. This is where an army is raised for an external invasion when the internal situation of a country isn't good. As in, you embark on an external military campaign in order to distract the people from their own internal worries. I think this is another one of those distinctions that we can all relate to, right? The idea that some wars and propping people up as external enemies, that they are just a distraction to keep the citizens' attention away from how their own rights are being stolen is quite a prevalent one. I thought George Orwell was brilliant for portraying it so well in Animal Farm. And here's a guy well over 2,000 years ago stating it in such a matter-of-fact way. So these are the five types of armies and five types of war that can threaten a society according to Master Wu. I've always found it interesting to see how human thought is often a continuum that's much longer and wider than we think. As you can see here, many concepts that are still relevant today, even from a Western perspective, were once elucidated and discussed by ancient Eastern scholars who are forgotten now. In terms of ideas and knowledge, perhaps there is no Eastern and Western approach. Perhaps it's all one unbroken crisscross of ideas being exchanged and developed, by the two hemispheres for thousands of years. If you like content like this, please don't forget to share and subscribe. Thank you, take care and I'll see you soon.